Welcome, everyone, to the last episode of Series 20. We get into some great discussion with Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor about their game Heart, which is kickstarting tomorrow. If you're listening the day this episode releases, obviously, if you're not, then I don't know, it released on a different day, I guess. Um, (laughs) But you probably should listen to this the day it comes out because we're great and we should be top on your list of podcasts. (laughs) Before we get to the episode, as usual, some announcements. Yeah. Uh, first up, we have one final leaf week left uh, on our review drive, uh, and we are currently sitting at 45 five-star reviews in Apple Podcasts, and we would really love to hit that 50 mark so we can commission some really fantastic art of our Go Shanks to Go characters uh, for a t-shirt that you'll be able to select from if you win the contest. Uh, to be eligible for the contest, uh, and if you like what we're doing on this podcast in general, uh, you just need to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think. Uh, we'll pick from that list and give one lucky winner the option of a free Akatacon badge, uh, where you can meet us in person uh, this year, or to select a free Character Creation Cast branded t-shirt from our store. The contest goes until September 23rd, which is just next week. Again, if you're listening to this on the day it comes out. (laughs) Unfortunately, scheduling's been a little bit crazy lately, so we won't have our normal episode on September 23rd. Thankfully, though, there are five Mondays in September. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the only time anyone has been thankful for extra Mondays, but that's fine. (laughs) Um, Our Evolution Cast episode's going to be moved to September 30th, which is where we will announce our winner. Uh, Also, hitting that 50 review mark will make us would make us immensely happy and the t-shirt design thing would be incredible i think it's some of our favorite characters and hashtag slippery john um (laughs) so good uh so every review does help us out Mm -hmm. and once you do submit those reviews uh, we will go ahead and read them out here during our cold opens whenever we are able to record together uh like this one from bladalio I hope I pronounced that right, from the United States of America on iTunes. Uh, They titled it Childhood. Character creation was my favorite part of RPGs when I was young, so much so that I have developed a passion for understanding personalities. I see others as unique characters and we choose who we want to be by how we live our lives. I love your podcast because it reminds me of my childhood, taps into my passion, and you're one of the few gaming podcasts I feel comfortable listening to because you don't have to use foul language. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry that my kids are listening. Thank you so much for this safe and fun place to hang out. Well, thank you so much. That's really nice. And, um, and I feel I feel validated. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, I'm watching Ryan's face too, and he's like, take that, Amelia. <laughs> it is Ryan's rule. Uh-huh. Don't use foul language. I, that's fine. I can handle it. I can suck it up. It is good because then I can listen to it with my kids in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, though they're kind of like, ugh, mom, why aren't we listening to your podcast? <laughs> so, because that's um, good. Because it's good. <laughs> darn kids appreciate my work we love kids <laughs> they're they're great mostly <laughs> oh my well thank you so much for that review that was really nice mm-hmm. with all that out of the way let's get to the episode yeah enjoy discussion episode. Last time we created characters for heart. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor, the designers of this game, which is on Kickstarter tomorrow if you're listening to this episode the day it comes out. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone and tell us a little bit about the characters you made in our last episode? My name is Grant Howitt. I'm one of the one of the authors of Hearts and a bunch of other stuff like Honey Heist, One Last Job, etc., etc. Uh, I made a character called Blanche Fleur, who is a lunatic priest 
who's exploring the city beneath in search of deeper mysteries concerning her, the moon goddess that she's devoted her life to. And I'm Chris Taylor. I write Grant. I write games with Grant quite a bit. I write Grant's uh, games. I write Grant's <laughs> games for him sometimes, and then he just pops his name on it and makes it look good. Um, and I made a forced hound, somebody who's been forced down into the heart and has kind of fallen in accidentally into law enforcement after a terrible crime. And their name is Robert Erod. Nice. Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. My character is named Charles. Um I made a junk mage who is penitent, um, trying to do better, but also maybe not really doing better. <laughs> Ryan, what about you? Um, I made a enlightenment witch uh, named Snow Blanche. Uh, she is the closest thing probably to a Disney princess in the world of heart. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's genuinely a good rendition. <laughs> yeah. I'm very impressed. Um, and yeah, uh, so she talks to animals and uh, has a little animal familiar and can also see ghosts. Excellent singing voice. Yep, yep. That's, that's, that's just part of the flavor. <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive into our segment we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? In this segment, uh, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and other systems. And we already asked Grant about his entry into RPGs, but Chris, uh, would you love? We would love to hear yours as well. Uh, so the way I got into RPGs is well, kind of the source of a lot of problems in my life. Uh, my mother gave it to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, when I was about nine, I went on a business trip with mum and dad and to keep me quiet, they took me to like a big Toys R Us and bought me one of the, one of the early starter sets for the set for second edition Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. And I then proceeded to play it on my own in a hotel room for six hours. Um, and kind of fell out of, it kind of fell out from there really. It got a bit crazy and now it's my career. Mm-hmm. Which it snowballs is good. really quickly, doesn't it? It does. And it's like, all downhill. You know what? As I say, of all the things my mother's given me, that's my favorite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I love that they were selling that at Toys R Us back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it was a starter set, and they did like they had the old little packets of chess X dice, um, and it was really nice going in there. And places like Waterstones, like a big just a standard chain bookstore. Mm-hmm. They used to have like the old second edition settings, like you could find like Ravenloft and Arkadim mm. and all the weird stuff. And it went away for one. Now, thankfully, it's all coming back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like, think I saw my... some D and D stuff at Target the other day. Yeah, like it's 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 becoming mainstream enough that it's become accessible again, rather than mm-hmm. a thing you have to go to a store that sells it. Yeah, or check online or whatever. You could just go, oh, Dungeons Dragons, what is this? I shall get horribly involved for the rest of my life. <laughs> Though I wish it were more than just D and D, but that's a conversation for another time. No, fine. <laughs> How did you both decide what kind of characters you wanted to have in this game? Do you mean like in general, or the ones we just made? Uh, no, in general, like what kind of classes oh, okay. you felt fit in this game? Ooh, it took us a while. It yeah, took us a long it time. Really did actually longer than Spire, I think. Mm. to try and work out what we were doing because we didn't just want it to be Dungeons and Dragons we didn't just we, we didn't want to have like, okay so this guy's the cleric and this guy's the fighter and this guy's the rogue blah, blah, blah. we wanted their, we wanted them to stand out and I think like the first few drafts we had they didn't reflect the setting in any way they were just like we had we had a cool wizard who did stuff and we I wrote up a bunch of different spells you could have and we nothing was none of the classes were um, what's the word illustrating the setting in the way that the ones from Spire did. So, like, uh, The Knight of the North Docks from Spire, which is a perfect example, in that it says, here's uh, here's something true about the drow, here's something about the city, here's here's what... Uh, he, he, most drow are X and these guys are Y, and it lets you explain stuff. And so we went through quite a few iterations. Uh, we had Sun Clerics for a while, uh, which we cut out. We had um, very posh hunters, which we couldn't come up with a way to play them when you weren't just a colonialist... Um, bad person. Yeah, we mm. essentially made a class that was Van Pelt from Jumanji. <laughs> mm. and um, the thing, which I still want to kind of put in the game somewhere. We're going to put him in his next year advance, I think. Yeah. 
uh, because that is that is something which you can play with an invert and like the best like the best thing is is, is that we can write rules which are effectively um, undermining the core concept of the character in a paradoxical way, which is fun. But we did that. Um, we also wanted to look. We also looked at Spire and extrapolated from there, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, for instance, one of the one of the major classes, the Incarnadine, is literally the inverse of of a Spire class. Mm. Um, if you if you look at it in detail, some of its powers are actually identical to the Azurite ones, but the opposites, mm. Mm. Um, because they they worship a different god of the sort of the same godhead, as it were, like almost the same entity, but mm. they're they're different in their motives and how they interact with the world. Um, like the as 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 you are in the spire setting is is all plenty, and Incarn is all absence. And mm. what's in it for me? It's greed, yeah. and it's it's awful, and it's about making characters that start from that point of "Hello, I'm the worst human being you can possibly imagine," mm. and redeeming themselves in a lot of ways, um, and but or potentially not, but yeah, it gives you the option. Yeah, uh, and the other like the other thing like the calling, which I think is 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 a is a massive part of the character in terms of fiction and in terms of drive and story, but not so much mechanically because there wasn't we tried we couldn't we 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 experimented with having lots of different stuff in the callings, and it turns out that it was just too much to try and gel both things together. So we put most of the weight in the class, and then had the calling power the machine which makes the class work, yeah. and the callings. Um, like there's definitely backgrounds you can have in games, are definitely things like that. But I've not seen uh, I've not seen something which takes the idea of your character arc and says, "Here it is, right from the start. This is what you've got." And the way you get there is up to you. But you have an end in mind, and yeah, you, you, you have your own. How you want, yeah. The 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 place I the place I've got to say place I stole it from didn't quite steal it from that. It's from Marvel Heroic Role Playing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the the more recent one, and they have this really cool thing where unfortunately you can only play. Um, pre-generated characters so you play a wolverine you play a mystique or what have you but you'll have so like say in wolverine you get three xp uh when you go back to save someone even though you said you wouldn't and so you get these little these little beats that you hit which let you which which reward you for doing things like wolverine does in the comics mm -hmm. and so by, by taking that idea and saying okay so we want a character arc and it's going to get worse and here are major things and here are little things you can do and here's the big here's the whole point of your character and then just giving people those keys and being quite upfront about it, we think that's quite exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also like when we were looking at the classes and what do we bring, what do we leave out? Mm. Like we we started at the very beginning of going right. This is a ranger type character. This is a mm. cleric type character. And then we went, ah, just play torchbearer. Yeah. At that point, mm. like torchbearer is a really good dungeon crawler. Like it's grim, it's gritty, it's it's a nightmarish game because it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't link story intrinsically at the character level. It doesn't progress arcs in the same way that we wanted in that sort of narrative story game style. So we thought, all right, we're looking at this from the wrong way. We're looking at what roles can they fulfill in a party. That's wrong. What we need to look at is what stories is it fun to look at in these mm. situations. Mm -hmm. So you've got the junk mage. You've got somebody who has that, like, in a standard D&D game, you've got a wizard who gets almost limitless power. What if that's a problem? What yeah. if that? What if you can? What if, what if you can get too much power and get, get drunk on it, and then that power starts going away? Like you're addicted to it. This, this, mm -hmm. is, this is an issue for you. That's a. It's an interesting story and an interesting arc we can tell. And by combining the callings and the classes, you you mix and match this kind of deck of st story arc and how you go about fulfilling that story. Mm. Um, that's really interesting, and you can either pick it up and play it just dead as written just fall into it or you can tweak every little aspect of it to your own flavor and put your own spin on it and it's as much contribution as you're willing to make the game can cope with so for, for example um in my in my monday night game we were doing a playtest and one of the characters played a missian knight and they wanted to play a knoll and rather than having the weird experimental technology of the humans and dark elves and the missian they were like oh i want i want uh i want uh, a fish i want gin uh, in my armor, and so they've got this like weird fizzing bronze armor and this glowing hammer, and like it, mechanically, it doesn't matter. Just say what you want. That's fine. You got exactly the same rules as, as another Vermissian knight, except you get to be special. Mm -hmm. And something which we've always encouraged people is to take up, take the ideas and put different skin on top of them, put different flesh on top of them, mm. uh, because that means you can really get into it and you start 
you can start like working out how can we how can I make this power make sense in the new paradigm? Yeah. yeah, and for instance, just just use another character that's in one of my my play tests. I've got an enlightenment heretic in my game, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get to heaven, i.e., the bottom of the spire where they believe heaven is, before their brother who has just died. <laughs> <laughs> So they're racing their spirit down to the afterlife so they can essentially bolt the gate so that he doesn't go into heaven and he can do a full resurrection. Ugh. And that's, that, that's with the enlightenment calling that we've, that we looked at last episode. Mm -hmm. That's a completely different turn on, on how you can interact with enlightenment. It's like, well, I need to learn more about this. I need to learn where it is. I've got to find it. I've got to learn how to do resurrection. That's not even in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got lot, lots of ways to do that. Inspire, but none, none in heart. No, none at all. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really lovely just seeing people t go full tilt at something when mm. they're given the framework to do it with. And I think that's something we talked about with Spire too. At one point, we were talking about like a weapon that does d6 whatever and we talked about like if you want it to be ghosts it can be ghosts if you want it to be a gun it can be a <laughs> yeah. gun like it is yeah. just whatever you want it to be mm -hmm. um and I, I think that this game does that really well that you can kind of flavor things however you want and still have the feel of the narrative mm -hmm. yeah i mean like even in in real base terms like the rifle that my character had the the hound in the last episode that we made has a legrand rifle uh, that's not detailed. Mm -hmm. It's just called a Legrand rifle. Mm -hmm. um, Inspire was a little bit detailed and it was the standard issue firearm of their military services. But that's it. Mm -hmm. There's no like, this is a matchlock firearm forged in 1842 and there's no history to it. You put the history on. If it's important to your character, important to your story, you're going to build on it because it's cool. Mm -hmm. And we just give you that space to, to do cool stuff. It's been an interesting challenge being more... So one, getting popular, because Spire is our most popular <laughs> thing that we've done. But two, providing a Discord so there is the instant capacity to come and speak to us about something. Mm -hmm. And so people will see something and they'll say, oh, wow, I'm just really interested. What's the deal with this? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you thought, you thought, like, like, like someone might get in touch and say, hey, what, what's a relic bludgeon? Whatever. Like, what, what, what do you think it should be? Because we just like we've just picked these cool words, and then you and then you go at it, and like so much of our world building is coming up with something which is like, oh, what's that? And then being able to explore and come up with it yourself, and that's one of the one of the great things about role playing is you can find out and you can define that yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to resist the temptation to write everything down beforehand in a big fat book. What is the difference between sparking imagination? and defining the limits on imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I want to start the engine rather than tell you which way you're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just let, let people just go nuts with it, because you're going to have fun. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you, even if you just sat in a room with your mates making up a story, with no mm -hmm. rules, no anything, you're going to have fun. It's, but, but when you codify it and when you focus it down onto specific themes, it becomes a lot easier to explore, a lot easier to interact with. Mm -hmm. And any way that we can do that, especially with setting stuff, is great. And I never, ever want to see one of our books. This is the history of the world from 25,000 years ago. I don't, that's if, not interesting to me. That, like, it Chris, doesn't matter. If I ever write that, I need you to business divorce me. That's fine. <laughs> it will be messy. I think, I mean, that's a thing that I've talked about a number of places too, because obviously like game design isn't my thing. I don't know a lot about it. Um, but trying to find that balance between something that is narratively very open and wide and um, almost like just a, handing somebody a blank sheet of paper mm, and then sure. giving them rules and information on every little thing. Um, I described it as like the jello to sand continuum. And like, <laughs> like sand is too crunchy. You should not eat sand. And jello is like maybe a little too wiggly and we're not entirely sure what it is. Um, and somewhere in the middle is potato chips and that's like a really good place to be. And <laughs> <laughs> this is my game design theory. This. It's the jello to sand continuum. Um, but potato <laughs> chips is like a really good place to be where you have some structure and like ideas to kind of work within, but it's not enough that you are like bogged down and you feel like you can't do the things that you want because there's just too much to pick apart yes or there's or there's too much to learn there's too much to understand before you can make informed decisions mm -hmm. now where, right. where does dip go in this continuum because Ooh. you use that's kind the, of a jelly you use like the crisps to pick up the salsa and dip 
I've always thought of crisps as a cross between jelly and sand. 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's clearly the exact middle point. That's why but you like, get jelly flavoured crisps and sand flavoured crisps. Right. In, in your continuum, like, we're kind of aiming for, for crisps, but we're definitely erring on the side of jelly. Yeah. So it's, no, I think it's I, then it's, it's after you've yeah. dipped them and they like get a little bit softer. Yeah, we like a good flexible crisp around here. Yeah. Actually, actually, you know, I think I think that we are dip. Okay. In that in that you can take you can take a robust chip, which is your understanding of a fantasy world, and just dip it into our wonderful strange setting, and it makes just the chip better. Smear it in cream cheese, and that's us. One of the um. <laughs> one of the, <laughs> That's, that is literally us yeah. smeared in cream. One of the uh, the chappy uh, Mark Rosewater uh, did a it was, it was a twenty lessons he'd done in twenty years of writing Magic the Gathering. He did a talk for GDC. Is uh, I would recommend if you've not seen it for every game designer out there who who thinks they know their stuff, watch it because it's genuinely important. Yeah, he tells you things you already know, but he's like, oh, I didn't know I knew that. It's really wonderful. But one of the things that that, that he talks about is people is that you need to use the literacy of your audience. So like you can assume people know what a minotaur is. Mm-hmm. If they're coming to a fantasy game, you can assume and they're already playing Magic the Gathering, they can that you can draw a picture of a bull with horns and write minotaur and they're not going to be like what the hell is this? Why is why is, why is, why is he walking around on two legs? They can understand that. And so it's up to you to use the the uh, implied cultural um, understandings of this stuff. And like, some people are more literate, some people are less literate, but taking, we all know what fantasy is, right? Okay, move it around, shuffle it. And if you have no prior knowledge of fantasy, then I'll be honest with you, our games aren't quite as interesting because we're not, we're not sort of, we're not inverting anything. We're not taking a fresh look at anything which you already know. And also that well, so there's a load of huge gaps in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, like, well, like where, uh, what are the economics of this place? You know, um, does gravity work okay? <laughs> in, in, it's fire, fine. like one of the big ones of crop types, like what happens if there's a fire? Oh uh, god, we had no idea. We had we had to write a box out and we had to write a whole section when somebody said, "What happens if there's a fire?" Like that's a really good point. It would kill that, everyone. That is great. <laughs> uh, well, I know that I I was playing in a game when we recorded about Spire last time too, and I had a fr- the one of my friends was running it, and he was very concerned about like making sure that he was doing the setting justice. And then after he listened to our episodes, he was like, oh, I'm doing it fine. It's like (laughs) whatever I want it to be. And I was like, that's what I was trying to tell you that like, I mean, there's so much cool stuff there. And so it's really easy to want to like play into that, but also like, Mm. you know, like those are hooks. They're not like hard and fast rules. Yeah. The, 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 the optimum thing for us is when somebody reads through the book and goes, this is all cool. This bit's my favorite. Mm-hmm. Because that's the bit you base a campaign around. That's the yeah. bit that your your game revolves around, and then the rest of the the game is either not there, like you can completely ignore it, or you can go actually I can take this faction and use them really effectively. Mm-hmm. And while we may have set up like a counter faction, you don't have to use them. Nobody cares. It's your game. And like in our in in the in the adventure we've got in the quick start. Uh, I made up a bunch of stuff. Like we don't use the established landmarks in there because I'm like, oh, actually, these these don't these don't quite tell the story I want to tell. I want to tell a different story. Blah, blah, blah. And that, that's like we want to encourage people to be able to say, oh, actually, I like this bit. I'm going to change the, and smush these bits around. And now these guys are in here and go because it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a toolbox, <laughs> not a sandbox. <laughs> Well, and I think that that's something that we got into a little bit in our panel at Gen Con too when we were like fleshing out the backgrounds for our characters. Um, In between making jokes about mayonnaise. Well, I mean, that's the thing, is that, like, mayonnaise is not an important part of the setting, but it was very important to the story we were telling. Yeah. Yeah, we had illegal mayonnaise runners. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, like a mayonnaise speakeasy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hey, give me me tree fingers and mayo. (laughs) Uh, None of that artisanal crap. In a pint glass. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get it out with, like, with a fork. Make it runny so it's drinkable. Hey, oh, water no. it down. Oh, why? Oh, gross. <laughs> Super so, yes. gross. Uh-huh. So I, I think that answers, that answers at <laughs> yeah. least three questions, one of which you may have asked. Uh-huh. Um, well, this is uh, specifically a dungeon, dungeon crawl type game uh, as well. Are there specific things that you felt you needed to add uh, as character options for that type of game? Um, and also, what about uh, a game that has these elements of body horror? So, 
when you're looking at the standard obstacles within a dungeon crawler, you're looking at things like traps, uh, crevasses to jump over, that kind mm-hmm. of... There's a lot of that physical nature. Um, and when you're doing a story game, traps kind of don't work anymore because they don't know where you're standing, mm-hmm. right? You're not standing in the five-foot activation square. You don't know if you're caught by the fireball as well. So we had to look at other problems. We had to look at things like um, NPCs being the issue and the environment as a whole, like storms or the ground being made of fire or whatever, um, and give people tools for overcoming that rather than the granular nature that you get in like a 10 foot long corridor that dog legs left into a temple that you get in other, in other dungeon crawlers. Um, and by doing that, it gave us this kind of better look into how to suddenly work out how the journeys worked. Mm. Because the journeys, the only actual like true dungeon crawly bit is a journey between two known locations. Mm. Without a connection between them. Yeah, you make a connection between them. And that is kind of a dungeon crawl, like a traditional dungeon crawl. Mm-hmm. But the big points are the beginning and the end. The bit in the middle are well, what we kind of internally call, call story beats. Um, where you, you hit a landmark and maybe you get a scene and maybe that scene is a monster that's going to kill you or maybe it's just a quiet place of contemplation where suddenly you're alone with your thoughts which is a rare thing in, in the heart because something's always happening mm-hmm. um, and if we wanted to lean into that so that's what we changed the character abilities towards mm-hmm. rather than a granular trap based economy essentially mm-hmm. We've also, uh, when we were like when we've, we've done quite a few passes on this, uh, repurposing the Fallout system. So uh, the so in, in, it was written initially for Spire, and it, so like as we as we discussed in the last episode, it, it does hit points, but it also does sanity, but it also does how close you are to getting the door kicked in by the secret police, that sort of thing. It's all, all, all badness that can happen to you, mm-hmm. and there's different kinds of badness that can happen in an underground uh, infinite city. So we wanted to sort of mess around with that a little bit and see what we could do, and we kept hitting problems with the supplies fallout because we were like we we're like oh well how do we write rules for you're running low on torch fuel how do we write rules for you're hungry and we we we, we realized that the interesting bit wasn't oh you're getting hungry the interesting bit is you are starving to death mm-hmm. and another one of our um another one of our philosophies we were talking last episode about one of our philosophies that you, sh- you should always want to pick every power you see one of our philosophies is stolen from a uh from a, a tv show called spaced which i don't <laughs> know whether it landed in, in in the u.s it's a very early simon Pegg. Yeah, I've right. watched a little bit of it. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 pleasing rather than laugh out loud funny. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it is have... also eerily reminiscent of pretty much every English kid's adolescence. Yeah, and just after. Good. And they have uh, one character is explaining something to another character who doesn't care, and the character goes, "Skip to the end." <laughs> and that's that's our that's our that's try to try to be philosophy, which we've done. So one, no dead levels, and two, skip to the end. Like like that's that's the boring bit. At the, at the start, can we just have the bit which gives you the exciting, the spike? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's your torch has gone out and, so, and, and, and something's gone wrong rather than your, rather than, oh, you don't have any fuel, so you won't leave this bit. No, 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 no. We don't, we're not interested in the, in the reasons that have led you up to the problem. We're interested in what the problem is and how you can solve it. And so we looked at, we tried to come up with all the horrible things that could happen to you in a dungeon and then just put them in the game as Fallout and the Fallout is typed towards what, what, what particular things you've been doing. So it, everything exists, exists in potentia. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Were there specific lessons that you learned from making Spire that you felt applied to this game? That's a tough one, actually. Lessons? Um, Have we learned anything? We're very bad <laughs> learners, especially from our own mistakes. We, um, okay, one thing we didn't learn sure. is, is defense. Oh my god! So Chris and I have our white whale. Our, our, our the, the the white whale which we both share is so we've written what is it, um about I think we've written three systems together now. Yeah, three major um, systems. Yeah. Three major systems, and between those, they've had I'm gonna say like f- I'm not exaggerating, forty five drafts in total, yeah. but, but between them, like different iterations of the, of the system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We'll start writing a game. We'll be like, oh, cool, cool, cool. I've got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, you play, you play this kind of character. Yeah, okay. Oh, and you've got these cool abilities. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's great. And there's the world. Oh, you've got oh, cyberpunk. Oh, oh, angels. Cool. Okay, so what happens when someone shoots the players? Uh, oh, okay. Well, how does armor work? 
um, uh, uh, and we completely lose it. We have every like, time. We, we always get armor wrong. We always get resistance and toughness wrong. For some reason, when the world acts on the player, we just forget. We cannot make that work. And we've done it again. We're hard. <laughs> <laughs> like it took us. It took us like let's call it a day, like a full day's work to get this kind of full outline of everything we wanted to do with 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 heart. And then it took us maybe three months to do the defense system. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how our time was shifted. It, it, yeah. it was, and we we should have done that first. We should have worked out how interactions mechanically function before we worked out necessarily exactly what mechanics we wanted for that. What junk right? mages do. Yeah, what yeah. junk mages do is irrelevant if you can't it'd be interacted upon by the world. Mm. It's an, it's a it's a weird thing. Um, I think that um, writing Spy did teach us that it's a back and forth between that. So you, you need to understand the world. You need to understand what kind of stories you're telling. Uh, and the easiest way for us to do that is to write classes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the bit of our job which we are both most excited about and most scared about because that's where the bulk of our rules go. Mm -hmm. And writing those, it's like, oh, cool, we're sketching out the setting. And there's all these cool potential stories you can tell. And I find that if you just go straight mechanics and get all your mechanics set up first, and you end up writing yourself into corners. And so I think there's, there's, there's like, a, of any good process, especially when you're building a game of this size and the scope, there's a back and forth between, okay, here are the characters, here's what I can do. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's how, here's how those rules are. Okay, go back and change the characters. And yep. there's a, you sort of just smudge everything together until you hit playtest. It's one of the reasons that we, that we do the long drawn out process of iterative design. Yeah. So we make a game. We call it min minimum viable game. The base tiniest level that it will work at, we reckon. And then we look at it as a whole unit, as like it was finished and go, well, this bit doesn't work. This bit doesn't mm. work. We circle bits in red pen and then we start again. Mm. And yeah. we'd use what we learned from the last one. And we keep doing that. And we stripe it over and over and over until we get a game that we are very happy with. And it works. It's, it's, it's long-winded it and exhausting. Uh, <laughs> I will also note that is the precise opposite of my design process on one-page games. Yes. In that, like, that's... I'm going to say, like, you're looking at second draft tops. Sometimes I've just written it out by hand, mm -hmm. loose, and then we go. Those are much more expressionist um, game poems, but this is a, this is a finally old machine. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, a big greasy machine. On that question of defense, is that because you just haven't figured out how to do it, or is it because it's not something that's like particularly important or interesting to you? I think it's massively important, and that's potentially the problem we had with it. Mm. Um, there's got to be some, uh, to, to put it in, in electronic terms, some logic gate mm -hmm. as to why something affects you but not another thing in every mm. system. Yeah. Um, that can be as simple as um, a line in the rule that says, player characters don't hit other player characters. It just doesn't happen. Like Your characters can't die, whatever. Or it can be as intricate as like a full PvP system. Mm. Something that like technically Dungeons and Dragons can support, Emberwind can support, all of these like tactical role-playing games. Um, and it's, it's an important thing to know. And especially when you're looking at something as, as invasive as Heart is as a game, um, you need to know exactly and precisely the conditions under which that you are affected. Mm -hmm. And... We when we when we when we do minimum viable game, that is a really easy place to essentially cop out, sure. to just put in for, for a better putting an armor class. Cool, that's handled. Yeah. Off we go, and yeah. then we create all these wonderful powers that we're really excited to use that then don't quite interact right with that previous system. Um, and for some reason, I'm never 100 percent sure why, but it's always defense that trips us up in the first mm. first couple of drafts. Is it because of the specificity of the other powers that like it's hard to define how you would defend against that i think so i think the challenge that we faced is that we can get your base defense we can get like here like, here, here is the chance of a of an average person something going averagely wrong mm -hmm. and the thing we really struggle with is how do you get better at defending yourself mm -hmm. and then how is that interesting Mm -hmm. how yeah. is that how is that smooth to play how is that easy to remember how does the gm not have to reference everything how do you need to do the, the least amount of maths possible and i think i think i think this is because we're because in this um and miniatures painting we are perfectionists 
Well, Chris is a perfectionist of miniatures painting. Well, I also think it goes into that, like, dead levels thing, too, that that's not necessarily an interesting thing to increase when you're yeah. when you're advancing. It's like, yeah. oh, cool, I have one yeah. more defense. Like, that's not yeah. fun. I mean, interestingly, this is something that we, we learned from the playtest. Um, we put out this massive playtest. Like, there's a whole lot of content in there. Um, a lot of it has changed for the actual game. Um, <laughs> But one of the things is that the minor abilities that you, you saw earlier, um, a lot of them are like gain plus one blood protection. Mm-hmm. Necessary, honestly, mechanically speaking, to have an ability to increase protection to blood. Yeah. Boring. Real boring. Mm-hmm. So now what we've done is we've split it out. And so there's every single class has the ability to get um, a minor ability that is plus one protection to one of the protections, uh, one of the resistance tracks. Mm-hmm. except for one and there's also one for skills and there's also one for domains and again every, so you're missing one of them for every mm-hmm. single one okay and then all of the other miners same amount of miners as now are like gain plus one blood protection and you can talk to dogs mm-hmm. or um you gain the warren domain you are completely invisible when in darkness mm-hmm. so you get you get get the ability to craft and create a character in the way you want to with the building block level ones. Mm -hmm. Or you can take these ones that maybe push you towards a bit more story and a bit more character, but you've got the option. Mm. Um, And it's about creating those options in as as loose and interesting a system as possible while still being mechanically sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that... I would imagine you are not the only people that have a hard time with defense because I can't think of a game that I've played where it has felt like... mm, not clunky, I guess. That like mm. it always feels like even in a narrative game, like this is the one like sort of mechanical thing that you have to keep track of. I don't yeah. know a lot of games that do it smoothly. If you if you look at the alternative, so like Lady Blackbird, uh, by John Harper, has con- has conditions which go in your character and they're things like captured, uh, injured, tired, dead, whatever. Mm-hmm. And no rules for them. Not, not a single rule for any of those. And there's lots of rules for performing actions, but none for the conditions. And it takes the consequences out of the game. Mm-hmm. And like, I, mean, I, mean, I was going to say, I absolutely adore Lady Blackbird. It's been a huge inspiration for me throughout my career. Um, something so tight and precisely made. And the setting is told in such like vibrant, broad strokes. Hugely impressed by it. Uh, but in terms of the bad things happening to you, there's no real... Like it's 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 still the same fiction. It's it is exactly the same enforced mechanically as say walking into a room as it is mm-hmm. catching fire. And that's that doesn't quite that doesn't quite gel. So there has to be something mechanical, it has to be something there. And it's I think I think we're still struggling with it as an industry because I mean hit points, isn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. They don't make a lick of sense. No. I mean that's why we put fallout in, because if you look at it like stress is hit point loss. And fallout is the is the concrete, actual problem you're facing from hit point loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and we give you plenty of opportunities to get it, and quite a few opportunities to get rid of it. But it's mm-hmm. not as easy, mm-hmm. um, and it means that we can control the decline. Like we've got we've got the opening valve on the tap that let, that, that changes the flow of stress and incoming problems to a character, and it's what? about getting that in the right place. What a horrible tap. It's just the worst tap. Like it's just <laughs> it's just oil and hair. <laughs> oil and stress. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. nasty. So, uh, what does the process of character creation in this game uh tell us about it? Um I like to think that it's fairly simple. Um mm-hmm. and the, the the big problem you face is choice. Mm-hmm. Um because we wanted to kind of as you as you sort of enter the game at a character creation level, you're you're, you're asked, okay, so what do you want to do? Do you want to cast a magic? You know, these are like little questions, essentially. And then it suddenly blossoms out into cool. You know, you've got all these glasses. Pick one. All these glasses have thousands of different ways you can take it. Pick one. And none of them are wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, if I was playing Dungeons and & Dragons and I took point-blank shot, but not a crossbow, that's useless. Mm-hmm. Right? It's possible. It is possible to choose badly. Yeah. I mean that's that's a fairly obvious mistake. You probably should notice that. But you can make a bad character. Mm. We we wanted to make it so that everything was interesting and none of it was, was a bad choice. Yeah. Everyone was equally bad. Yes. 
um, like either incompetence or morally. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, yeah, we wanted that freedom and like that freedom is replicated further and further as you go out through the system and out through the world because again, we only do the, the first third. We set up the framework and then push you off the bridge. I think the other thing which character creation tells you is through picking a calling that you aren't right. Like you are not playing a happy, normal, well-adjusted person. Uh, mm -hmm. Even like even like the vanilla class, which is adventure. I'd say the vanilla calling, which is adventure. So that's mm -hmm. like I want to go and play play the fantasy role playing game, and you know, it, it gives you the beats you need to do to hit that. So fight mm -hmm. a big monster, steal its shoes, blah blah blah. The you're in this nightmarish other world. You shouldn't be acting like this. You're not <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And like everything, everything else. Like we want to try and get across the obsession for your character that you will do these things which have bear no relevance to the mission, bear no relevance to your job. Uh, they are dangerous. They are unsanitary. They are ridiculous. But you're going to do them because you're obsessed with this. And that pushes your character forward and that means you get more powerful. So what, so while it's a, uh, while you're all, you're all together for friendship, what the character creation is about is your own personal mad desires and how you can take advantage of other people to hit them. And I think the callings do that, which is nice. Mm. And, and one of the, one of the interesting things, I and mean, like this is actually really like apparent in the party that we made on this podcast. Um, <laughs> the character creation works two ways. So you're creating your character and your place in the world cool. What you're doing is you're telling your GM, this is the game I want. Mm -hmm. Like if I was you, if I was the GM of this party, I know I'm, my campaign's going to be featuring ghosts heavily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, animals. And animals. And like, it's going to be more wilderness. It's going to be more occult. It's mm -hmm. going to be cursed, you know, like ancient hauntings, people coming back from the dead, all of this sort of stuff. Whereas I if nobody had picked that, I don't need to bother with ghosts. Mm -hmm. They don't need to feature at all in my campaign if I don't want to. I just, I just came up with a really cool idea for your, for your hound's mission as well, which you've been contracted by a very bad man to kill his ex-wife again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and like that's a good, that's a good reason why I'm with the party, right? Because I've teamed up with people who can see ghosts. I can't. I have no idea. <laughs> so I need, I need to go. Oh yeah. Oh, there's a lost soul. We need to get rid of. How do you kill a ghost? I'm just going to trap in this box. Does she look like this picture? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just a big cross through it. Um, I forgot what I was saying now. You it's, so so the, the character's creation works two ways. Yeah. And like Spire was a good one for that because it had um, a power that I use as an example for this all the time, um, which is the Admiral power for the Knight of the North Docks, which gave you a boat. Uh, there's a river in precisely two locations in Spire. But, which means the rest of the spire is it's useless, completely redundant power. But what it's telling people is, I would like you to put canals and rivers all over my game. Mm -hmm. it, you, what, what a player chooses is always going to inform what a GM does, and we just make we just push that forwards. We just made it yeah. as strongly as we could, so it was really obvious. Yeah, the players the players have to at the start of every session tell them two things they want, please, and it's the GM's job to give them that in an exciting way. But also, it's the players players responsibility to also try and push for it like mm. as i said you've got like an npc turn up and one of your beats is you meet an npc who hates you you're fully at liberty as a player to go can this be the one that hates me yeah well, sure it can absolutely because that that's just saved me that's that saved me the difficulty of bringing this guy into the party mm -hmm. yeah oh i can't believe you'd show me your face around here all, all, get, all of my disappointed npcs have the same voice yeah and you get to use your evil voice which is always fun yeah <laughs> that's a thing that i gosh, people are going to be tired of hearing this, that I always go back to is players need to show up and they need to have input and they need to be an active part of the game. Like a game does not happen to you. And I think that there's a lot in this character creation that kind of drives that forward just by default that you've, you have to say what you want and mm -hmm. you've already expressed that even if you didn't entirely mean to. Um, which I think helps GMs a lot because I think a lot of times so much effort is put on them to create everything and then people are just like, cool. And then they get mad when it isn't the game that they want. And, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you have to say what you want. And I think that there's a lot in here that kind of starts that dialogue already just in the mechanics of the game. So we really need to run Unbound on this character creation podcast <laughs> uh un unbound so okay very sorry of course because you know we're already on here for a second time um but, you know, we don't have to run it maybe you get someone else to do it but unbound does the hands down not a boast 
best session zero of any game you'll ever have. Yeah. Uh, like you make, you 90% make, of the game is the character creation. You make That's the characters what it's about. and the world and the plot and the antagonists and everything at the same time mm-hmm. in session zero. And then the game basically runs itself. But it's perfect for this, where it's a, where your, your show's about world building. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We send you a copy, but it's been out of print for the last three years because no one bought it. I remember <laughs> you guys talking about it when it was coming out too. And I was like, this is, hmm, this is really good. But also I was like just getting back into gaming. And so I was like, I don't know what to do with the, that. The, don't worry. Like we, we, we didn't sell it properly either. Like well, we, and I think like we talked about this last to time too, that like generic systems are really hard to explain to people because it's like, yeah. how do you sell that other than like, here, make your own game, I guess. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like when you compare like a generic system to something as intertwined in its setting as Spire and Heart, <clears throat> where everything is dripping with more setting that you can build it from, build from. Mm-hmm. How do you sell a generic one? Like, yeah, do whatever you want. Yeah. Like what? Well, what Your idea is you better than us. Yeah. You can make an elf or a robot. Money, please. <laughs> please. But look, please. it's better than GURPS. Everything is. Yeah. I know. It's, ugh. Like losing a leg is straight better. Yeah. That's, I, I hate that when people are like, I don't know, why don't you just run it in GURPS? I don't know, why don't you just run it in D&D? Because <laughs> other games do these things better. And quicker. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's going to okay. be fun covering GURPS when we get there. No, we're not doing that. Oh, you I, should absolutely do GURPS. I, I want to hear you get angrier and angrier every time you have to make a decision. An oh, eight-hour I mean, podcast our, of you building a single sailboat. Yeah. You can listen to our Palladium series and hear. Yeah, we, we did Heroes <laughs> Unlimited, and, and Amelia had the best of times. Oh, my God, I was so angry. I've gone okay. back to listen to that one after this. <laughs> uh, what do you think are potential flaws in this character creation system last time inspire grant said that there were no flaws um <laughs> so a, maybe that's a fair and just time. assessment <laughs> um no he said it. i'm sorry it was too evocative um and then are there things <laughs> at that point it was like three in the morning so i'll yeah. allow it um and then are there things that you're particularly proud of here so i think one of the biggest flaws of the character creation and indeed the game is that it assumes a certain level of competency in um, imagination is the wrong word. Everybody has imagination, but the ability to to improvise and to throw out story and to be involved in a story. Confidence as well. Yeah, confidence. Um, it's not like like the, the beauty of things like Dungeons and Dragons is it can run on autopilot. Mm. Mm. Like. Sure, it's better if it's if everybody's really throwing their all behind it and telling this great story, but it can run on autopilot. Heart cannot. Yeah. It you cannot coast. It is all about all of the story, all of the time. Do it now. Do it harder. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is intimidating as hell to some people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I fully understand that that is a flaw with the system, but it's and, and the character creation. But it's a flaw that I'm willing to take on the on the chin. You yeah, know? which we, we we've written it in on purpose. So so like if if this is the game for you, it's better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would I would say also uh, compared to Spire, Spire had really nice uh, mechanics of making bonds between characters. We haven't got that in yet. Um, I would like to I, get I'd that like in to point out that if you're listening to this the day before or after the Kickstarter has come out. <laughs> yes, we have. We have. <laughs> That is going in, but between recording and playing... Yes, we are, we are, cur- we are currently <laughs> writing the book. Yes. Um, so I would, I, 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 would like to, I, I would like the final version to have more bonds and more mm-hmm. ways, of it, of, w- ways of tying your characters together, I think, because that was a really strong part of Spire. Mm. For instance, one of the things we've been doing in playtesting is I've been making... Uh, so Ooh. in the game you have places called havens, which are safe is the wrong word but safe uh, places stable. in the environment yes yeah, stable places in the environment and they're places you can get healing and some min- minor psychiatric treatment mm. that sort of stuff and i've been having a lot of people a lot of groups make a haven as like a unifying action mm-hmm. so at the beginning of the game you create characters and then we make a haven and now you've got a home base yep um and that really ties characters together and we're going to be using the the bond system um, from Spire with a couple of changes where everybody's like interlinked at least at some level. Oh. Mm-hmm. But just having like one little piece of stability in mm-hmm. this game is wonderful. Mm. Somewhere you can run back to when it all goes wrong. Yeah. 
um, it unifies everybody and it really pushes towards more stories because if they're doing really well in the game, unlikely, mm-hmm. but if they're doing really well, threaten their haven. Mm-hmm. You will instantly see them just throw caution to the wind. Yeah. Like set fire to their own armor so they do more damage to the enemy just so that they can save their haven. Um, mm-hmm. And it's been so fun. So fun doing mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I, I find that the, the collaborative world building part really is an auto buy in for every player that mm-hmm. contributes to that. I can see like the little bits of, of world building uh, through the different characters that we created. Um, yeah. And those parts being kind of personal to the player that created the characters. But when you come together as a group and create a singular place that's defined, that that place automatically becomes the special place in the yeah, world. Sure. And yeah, and then, like especially if you like delve all the way down, like months of play, let's say, in real time, mm-hmm. all the way down. I don't suggest you play for months and months and months, but still. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an exhausting game. It's so tiring. Um, and then finally you come back to that haven you made. Mm-hmm. Like, that feeling is great, mm. and we want to push that, and that's not in the playtest rules. Mm-hmm. Um, it will be in the final version, but not in the playtest ones. Um, and, yeah, keeping everybody unified and interested and on board with the story is key. Because mm-hmm. if everybody doesn't buy in, the game does fall apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, player buy-in is always, I mean, in every game, you need people yeah. to be interested and excited about the story that mm-hmm. you're telling. Exactly, yeah. And th- as I say, the, the biggest flaw is that if you don't have that buy-in, it doesn't work as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anywhere near as well. So is there something that you're particularly proud of here? Uh, the classes as a whole for me. Like, I think each one is massively interesting in their own messed up way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're all snacky. They're all interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like, I, there's not a class where I go, oh, I have to play the cleric. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, nobody should be left out. Everything's interesting. Everybody's got a, a, a part to play, not a role to fill. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I'm really, really proud of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that they all have like a little, it, because it, it feels like because you didn't do those sort of standard like D&D kind of classes, like this mm-hmm. maps onto this, um, because of the way that they're kind of, mixed in all those ways it feels like there aren't any that i'm like no i don't want that because i never play fighters i don't like Mm. them it's just not interesting to me and i don't see anything here that is like straight fighter that i'm like i no thank you like are there ones that i'm like i'm super excited about that this one's pretty good sure Mm. but like there's nothing in here that i think "Mm, no i would never play that Mm -hmm. yeah we wanted to make it so that if you wanted to play a fighty version of whatever you're doing, you can. They can do it in a different way to everybody else, sure. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to be a fighter, or you can be a fighter. Mm-hmm. Knock yourself out. Well, and, and that's another the, one of those that, like, it sort of directs the GM to what kind of game that you want to play, yeah. to mm-hmm. how you yeah, flavor sure. those things. I don't like combat-heavy games, so I wouldn't flavor it that way. People yeah. who yeah. do can pick things that go with that. Mm-hmm. And, like, we didn't want to exclude anybody based on preference. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, in some games, I've, I've known people, and I, I was my, one myself for quite a while, who only really played healers. Mm-hmm. And you, 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 there's a whole load of choices if you want to do healing. You, you can pick anything and do a bit of healing, a bit of something else. Mm-hmm. You, you've got control over how you do it. Um, and that, that, being, that, that ability to just go, yeah, all right, I'll go with this is what I'm proud with. Hmm. I like that. Really satisfying. So, uh, compared to Spire, how have you changed the system uh, in this game uh, to tell different stories? We've got different resistances, so there are different things you can lose. We've got uh, supplies. Uh, so uh, Blood and Mind are the same ones from Spire, but we have supplies, Fortune, and Echo, as we mentioned uh, earlier and in the previous mm-hmm. episode. Uh, so there are, there are like we're focusing on different things that you can lose basically. Um, the other thing we've done is because the game's got more fighting in, like Spire, although it was quite a violent game, it wasn't really about having fights every session. And Heart is much more um, it's, it's much more dangerous. There's much more, there's many more opportunities to get into a fight. So we've made the combat rules a bit more I'm not, I say we've literally expanded them in that stress uh, has two extra dice on top of it. So it used to be D3, D6, D8 stress and very little else. And now we go from D4 to D12 with everything in between, which gives you room to smudge up and down 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the line which gives us room to have more armor, which gives us room to make to to to, to have more incremental choices, which stack up to something really uh, really impactful, but means that we we can write m- more smaller rules around combat in that way. Um, we what else are we on, Chris? Uh, we've changed how you turn stress into fallout. Yes, that's um, true. So previously, what it was is. Add up all of your stress. Roll a d10. If it's under that number, you get you get fallout. Um, if it's if if you had below, I can't remember the number. Now, below six stress, it was minor fallout. Above major. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's three different flavors. Yeah. It's now severe. what? Now now what it is is you you just still do the same. You add everything up. You roll a d12. That sounds strange just to change a d10 to a d12. But it shifts it so there's less likely to be fallout. It gave us more room to play with. Again, gave us more room to play with. Um, and now, if the dice, if you roll underneath your stress and the dice show under six, you get minor. And the dice show over six, you get major. Mm-hmm. Now, that is like a semantic, tiny little change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what that does is that ripples out into the rest of the system and how survivable everybody is. Because what this means is you could take of 300 stress, just to give it a ridiculous number. <laughs> And walk away, mm. it's possible to walk away because you could roll low on the fallout dice, get a minor fallout from that, mm. and Spread still survive it. Um, and we've also given the DM the ability to upgrade fallout. So if you take a minor fallout and you take another minor fallout in the same category, the DM can get rid of both of those and call it a major. We did have that in the last game. We made it much clearer. Now. Made it much clearer um, and talked about how you can stack it if you want to. And for instance, critical fallout, which is death. Mm-hmm. Um, it's narrative death. So some of them are just, you get lost in the heart. You do all sorts of stuff before dying, whatever. But it it ends up as death. Your story's over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your story ends. Uh, the only way to get that is by upgrading two majors. Mm. So it has to be, the only way you can die is essentially after a dialogue between the DM and the player going do you want this do you want this to be the end of your character because i think it'd be really cool if it was mm. there's no way to just roll ah roll badly i'll roll a new character you I'll can't get one shotted it's impossible it's literally impossible to die in one and like it's a horrible hard. brutal game it's not it's not like an easy game mm-hmm. as you say. will lose legs and eyes but we don't just want to kill you straight out of the gate because that's not interesting. We want we want you want everything to go wrong to you beforehand. No, and death then, should be narratively yeah. important. Like it yeah. should be a big yeah. deal. Mm-hmm. It should be it so should exciting never be when an you accident. die. Um, uh, the so critical fallout, as Chris mentioned, it's a, it's a it's, it's a new grade of fallout basically. It's replaced severe. Uh, it has similar um, power, but it's, you can only ever upgrade to it now. You can't ever get it just straight out of the gate, and. The uh, Chris was talking in the previous episode, I think, about uh, getting a cult with Echo Fallout. So a mm. cult follow you around because they think you're an incredible, powerful person. If you level up that major Fallout with another major, the cult either A, decide you're a false prophet and kill you, or B, you believe you're a prophet and go off and found a new haven in the heart. Mm. And your story's over. But it's mechanically the same as dying. But we get to we get to we get to tell all these cool stories, and it's like you get this. You have an injury arc, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which yeah, like, which we which we've tried to really um, underline. We we have quite a few fallouts that are chains. So there's one in minor, there's one in major, and there's one in um, critical that are all interlinked. And they'll say like mm. this can be upgraded to, and mm-hmm. it will sort of prompt you along. And like the first one is uh, the ravening howl. <laughs> Uh, the Ravening Howl, it's it's an echo fallout, so it's uh, an interaction with the heart fallout, so it's weird. Um, and all it really does is there's a bit of a howling noise in the back of your brain, like tinnitus. Mm-hmm. Um, the major, um, this weird fractal dog, suddenly jumps out from behind a bush and kills one of your adversaries. Like, it actually helps. <laughs> um, and the, the critical fallout of that is you suddenly learn what's projecting this fractal dog, which is your own brain, which is where it hatches from. Um, yeah. And you have an, a you have a dog come out of your mind. Oh, part, I mean, the party has to kill it. The party has to kill it, and that's like that's a real simplification of the story. I'll admit, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> but like it grows. Like you, if if you follow this Fallout track all the way through, you've got this like foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a problem, and then you've got. You let the problem get out of hand. This is it's your an, fault. It takes the wackiness out of it. It lets it lets you it lets you build. Uh, it lets you build platform for the eventual payoff mm-hmm. in improv yeah. terms. 
Yeah, and as a player, it lets you lean into that, too. And so, like, be a little bit more in control and have some sort of agency over a potential Mm -hmm. death, too. Absolutely. Um, And, like, we tried to create a lot of them with various touchstones of Dungeon Dragons, of Call of Cthulhu, of things like that. So, again, as Grant mentioned earlier, that that, that vocabulary that we have, Mm -hmm. that prior knowledge we kind of put things adjacent to things people know so they can apply a quick flavor to it or make their own. Yeah. So I talk about the Ravening Hound. Um, if anybody knows Call of Cthulhu, that's based entirely on the Hounds of Tenderloss, mm. of these like extra dimensional time hunting dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if somebody's played Call of Cthulhu, they can go, oh, actually, that's a lot like something I know. And somebody that hasn't has their own view of it. Mm. And there's not a canon view of anything. Yeah, And that's yeah. so satisfying to try and pull off. That's very cool. All right. It's time for my favorite section. (laughs) It's the fan fiction section. We get to talk about how our current group works mechanically, um, how we think we would do in a game, and how do we potentially see this playing out. I think, you know, Chris, you mentioned that, like, there's going to be a lot of ghosts and kind of spooky stuff and Mm -hmm. talking animals. I do like the idea of having to hunt down someone's dead ex-wife. Yeah, like that that to me sounds really fun because what we've got in the party is we've got two people who can see ghosts, mm-hmm. one person who wants who wants to see ghosts but absolutely can't, and Grant. Oh. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. I have I have I have a stick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the thing. Like I think that I would uh like I'm definitely interested in under in like because because I've got heart song trying to find weirdness and trying to find strangeness and throwing myself at it and trying to understand it. So like, can I hit and kill a ghost? Let's find out. Mm-hmm. How do I harm ghosts? Are these go like uh, do do I need to harm ghosts? Can I eat ghosts? Is that going to bring me closer to the goddess? Are these manifestations of her? Can I level it? And so like trying to basically lick every window mm-hmm. on yep. my way down to the heart to try and to try and see what it tastes like. <laughs> So I, think, I, think, I think I can sort of gel along. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. picturing my character as not only like the the quintessential Disney princess, uh, but um, <laughs> when I befriend animals, all those animals are weird. Mm. Like I only befriend yeah. the, the weird ones, so I'm like treating these like horrors and like ghost creatures and stuff that I, only I can see sometimes as like. You know the the singing birds and like sweet forest the, critters. Yeah, yeah the like woodland forest it's, creatures it's, and stuff like that. It's half the ghost of a dog and half insect. Yeah, like, nobody quite knows what's going on there. Just you scr- can see scr- the half scr- 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 mandibles and yeah, and they're and they're just lovely to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, gosh, so what bad. is your what is your true form look like? Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to think of this this whole time, and it's got to be something like totally bizarre. Like not, so, not humanoid at all. I've had two mm-hmm. ideas. Okay. <laughs> One, the archetypical protean beast. So like a stag crossed with a wolf crossed with a snake, like every sort of terrifying chthonic beast. Or just a load of animals that all have the same eyes. Just oh, and they operate into a swarm. <laughs> oh, and you oh my operate God. this nightmare swarm rolling over everything. I do like that. Like the uh, scarabs in the mummy films, yeah. that kind of sentient, unified, chittering horde. Mm. Yes, I like that yes. a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, I wasn't thinking of anything like that. I was thinking more Cthulian horror, but I really Not like. Well, it works. I really like the um, the just splitting up into different creatures, and they all have kind of like a features that look a little bit like me if you're looking yeah. close enough. And, and and again, like they're all like, they're all the weird ones. They're all like they they all have weird bits mixed in, and yeah. like, they might all have like um, if if your witch has horns, they'd have the same horns and yeah. that sort of thing. They all have the same eyes, and they all have uh, humanoid teeth. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I like the idea that like when it happens, you sort of like melt into yeah. all of these things. Yeah, it's like, like a it's like a bucket a... of water just hitting yep. the ground. Yeah, like, yeah, just... <laughs> yeah. I love oh that. Oh my a god, lot. that's so good. That's gorgeous. I love it. But like that, just just by describing your your true form in that fashion, like that gives you a lot of narrative power and a lot of narrative weight in the world. Mm -hmm. Like your bugs, cool. You can get through tiny gaps now. Mm -hmm. Because we have no rules for tiny gaps. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really come up, you know? Nobody's crawling through five foot things. It doesn't matter. 
But mm. if ever there's a like a really like you get through a keyhole, mm-hmm. we've got the witch for the job. Probably, yeah. As long as we don't mind the witch eating everyone inside, we can get through the hole. Because <laughs> exactly. again, she can't turn that off until this is over. <laughs> it's swings and roundabouts, my friend. It's going to take. <laughs> you know, it happens. It does. They're friendly, but like yeah, that's... demonic critters. <laughs> yeah, like they're really pleasant. Mm-hmm. I like that. <laughs> because I picked the junk page in this penitent calling, I like the idea of this character that's like, addicted to magic but like also trying to get better um but also like needs it like to do well, their I mean, job you do also have pockets full of narcotics <laughs> right right yeah, it's not the i can thing you're i can to. quit anytime i want yeah sure sure just yeah. like i can unhook my veins from this otherworldly entity right <laughs> i'm sure it's fine yeah I can I can rip these wings off my back. I don't I don't ever need to fly again. Whatever. Look, it's fine. We'll just slowly titrate down. Don't worry yeah. about it. I'm working cool. on it. It's a process. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I think this this party's quite solid. Yeah, it's um where we don't have a lot of different domains. I think like from from a like from a from an explorey point of view, we're quite heavily focused, mm-hmm. and once we get out of that haven, we're going to start struggling. Yeah, but that's fun and what the game's about. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's okay. Um, I mean, we've got like, at least one delve, haven't we? We've got delve. I'm I'm pretty good at killing things. Yep. Um, I've got which, a gun. Hey, because you can solve most problems with. I can mend. Um, you can mend, you can talk yeah. to animals, and I think that I I can see, one, uh, we've got some really interesting stuff where we do what we're good at, and then the GM is like, okay, cool, it's technology now. They're like like yeah. a, a machine is breaking in, and this machine is building itself all throughout your wild lands. You have to stop it, or you don't have to stop it, but the haven will go, mm-hmm. and now we're out of our depth. And so now we're like, well, we've got, we got to try and learn about technology, we've got to pick up the domain, mm-hmm. blah, 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 and you know... Maybe get a, a fifth player in if we're missing a knight, throw them at the problem till they die. <laughs> yeah, so like when you've got a car- load of characters with a very focused list of skills and domains, what you end up with is um, like, you know, the, you know the sound of trope of like zero to hero. You've got that, but oscillating. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you're your superhero. You're using all these abilities. You're a god. This is amazing. Oh, we're somewhere else now. You, you're terrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You're trash. This is the place where you Run. fail. Now you run from everything. Before yeah. you could take on any any threat. Now you're going to die down here in the dark. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then you flee. And then you get somewhere you know again, and you go back up the, the oscillation, mm. and you're superheroes again. Whereas if you have a, a, a wide spread of abilities, it it's more of a flat line. Mm. You're okay everywhere. And the game and the, the, the setting and the system are very much built to handle both of those. It can it can do really deep lows, really high highs, and that sort of middle ground really mm-hmm. nicely. I um, think a I, lot of games have that idea that you need to have a variety of things. Like you need to have a healer and a fighter and a you mm-hmm. know whatever. Um, and I like the idea that we've made these characters that are all kind of heavily focused in this one area because it means that you wouldn't have a session where it's like, well, I can't really do anything here. We all are like really good at it or really bad at mm-hmm. it um but we are doing that together yeah mm-hmm. like we're all running away or we're all sh- giving it our best mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um there's no bit where well i'm a really good fighter this is a combat session you will go get some coffee and i'll kill all these goblins mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's less everybody's that. on the same page at all times and everybody's dealing with the same sort of problems but in their own specific ways and they're in their own ways of um I was going to say handling it, but handling it's the wrong word. Not handling it, like the fallout and the the addiction for some characters and that sort of stuff. Yeah. The, the, their own fallout, their own in, personal fa- story yeah. fallout. Yeah, yeah. Man, I want to play this now. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is it's, the it's, problem it's a with this show. Yeah, <laughs> I think, like ne- never ruin it. It's a it's a series of beautiful one night stands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, nobody nobody gets their gross game fingers all over it. <laughs> Everything is perfect the way it is. Don't touch it. Perfect crystalline. I, I, I feel we cheapened our our initial uh, episode by going back to it with James Tomato. Yeah, a little bit. Like, I like expanding on things, but there's also part of me that's like, oh, I don't know. Oh. I know too oh. much about this before yeah. I played it. It was such a beautiful dream. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> it's nice to know more about Mayo, though. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, we did learn a lot. All right, well, let's move into our advancement segment um, that we call Take It Up a Level. Take It Up a Level. Take It Up a Level. Which is a pun that Ryan wrote, and I hate it. And it's staying in forever. Uh, at least it works, because D20 for your thoughts doesn't work in my accent. I had to read it like four times before I understood what the hell it was about. Because it's penny for your thoughts, but it's a D20. Well, yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't pronounce it D20. D20. The same, way I don't, the same way I don't say a penny for your thoughts. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> Try it. It's fun. That's amazing. Okay, so in this segment, uh, we will cover how character advancement and growth uh, is covered in this system. Uh, so, uh, how do you think characters change as people within the narrative of this game as we advance? Well, how do we advance in the first place? So, we've discussed this um, previously, but to, to briefly reiterate, actually, Chris, why don't you do it? Okay, so the way you ad- advance in, in Heart is to fulfill beats provided by your calling. Um, you can also potentially get beats from things like extra advances that kind of tack on. But essentially, uh, when we picked at the beginning, like I picked um, do something dangerous to protect your past and learn or possess something that lessens control of my masters over me. These are scenes I want to see. When those scenes play out for good or ill, like you can mess up the scene however you want, mm-hmm. as long as the scene happens, um, you get a relevant advancement. So you'll notice that the callings are split into minor major and zenith zenith is really hard to do and is the end of a character arc Mm -hmm. so you'll mainly be doing minors with a smattering of majors every time you complete one you get a relevant advancement for your class so you get to pick another minor for your junk mage or a major if you just fulfilled that and that's it it's real simple Mm. there's no xp it's cool the story happened we had fun we're better also like it's it doesn't put the onus on the GM to remember and say, "Hey, now it's time to level up." Yeah. Uh, we've, we've tried to look forward to a more sort of to a more story game focused thing where the players are saying, "I want to do this," and it's and it's the it's advancement is rather than say um, we're we're rewarding a, a, an in character behaviour. So, so, like, so Dungeons and Dragons, you reward uh, tackling dangerous monsters or killing them or bypassing them or whatever. You get XP. Your character gets more powerful. It feels good. Push button number go up. Mm-hmm. And with us, what we're rewarding you for is having a conversation with your GM before the game about what you want to happen in the game, and then your GM giving that to you. Mm-hmm. So we're we're actually rewarding meta gaming through this advancement uh, good. system, because yeah. meta gaming is meta gaming is for the want of a better word good. Mm. It's it's not wrong. No. Mm-hmm. I I also want to point out too that it's n- not hard to do. I think that there's there's a lot of games where advancement takes forever and it's like four or five sessions before you can do anything. And Mm. like in our one shot at Gen Con, I got an advancement already. Mm. Um, So it it feels like you're constantly moving forward. Yeah. So at any one time you your character can hold two advancements, can hold two beats ready um, that you want to fulfill Mm -hmm. and any empty slots of those refresh between sessions. So in theory, you could advance, in theory, it's probably quite difficult to actually do. You could advance twice every time you sit down to play. Mm-hmm. And because it's technically possible for that, if we went through the fact of, cool, okay, you've leveled up. So now your base attack bonus increases by one, if you recorded that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get three skills plus four, one skill plus two. If we did that, it would Let's take forever. Let's talk spell points. Yeah, it would take forever. <laughs> so the whole point is that you just go, cool, that looks neat. I'll take that. And in a lot of cases, what the powers you're taking are things that you looked at in character creation and went, oh, I don't know which one to pick. Mm-hmm. Now you just pick the other one. And again, there's no bad interactions. You cannot make an ineffective character. It's impossible. Oh. Um, you can just have a gym. It doesn't listen to you. That's the- <laughs> yeah, like that, that's the only way to lose is, to have, is, yeah. to, is yeah. to have people in the game playing intentionally badly, like contrary to the way the group wants to play. Well, that's sort of like a motto of this show too, is don't <laughs> yeah. play with don't play bad games and don't play with people who suck. Yeah, yes. exactly that. Mm-hmm. Like, but aside from that, you can advance a character in under a minute. Yeah. Like you can fully level up your character. It takes going to take you more time to write out the power than it is to work out. <laughs> the, oh, it took the, me longer to read the sentence than to like actually put it on. Yeah. The, like it was just yeah. like, okay, I'll circle this one. <laughs> like yeah. like, if you, like as, as the example I've been using is the minor advance, which is like plus one blood protection. Now you can see ghosts. Yeah. 
how long does it take you to clock one number up by one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. it. That is the oh, yeah. mechanical problem the that you have to that you have to do with your character sheet. Mm-hmm. Everything else is that now you can go, hey GM, are there ghosts here? That that's it. There's always been ghosts here. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> this place plot. is lousy with ghosts. <laughs> Thousands of tiny bug ghosts. It's oh, no. snow. Um, yeah, so that's how quick it is. And obviously, if you're doing major advancements, it's a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. But again, like if you're if you're doing take, taking it for five minutes. Uh, that's a reading comprehension problem you've got. No, if, you, if you're doing Zeniths, reading real slow. <laughs> if you're doing Zeniths, you basically get your own session. That makes sense. Yeah, when you when you hit a Zenith, that is, hey, I'm going to steal the spotlight for one day. Yeah, um, because my character's dying, so pff, I've earned it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you largely become GM for that for I'm that gonna, period. Yeah, I'm going to do something hugely outrageous and destructive or creative, or I'm going to do something world changing, and then my character goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, like one of the uh, this, so like the the drowned queen zenith ability uh, for your character Amelia uh, is you marry the drowned queen. Oh, that's nice. I bet uh, we're really happy together. You get you get one or two sessions before you are retired as a player character due to um, you know backstabbing, but you get to rule over a drowned kingdom for a couple of sessions, and it's like it's like, like at that point we're like, listen, don't worry too much about the rules, because by the time you've hit the end of your character arc, you can probably just tell stories together. Mm-hmm. And you've got the backbone to go through that, but um, yeah, my favourite one is uh, the Vmissian Knight can summon the last remaining train uh, on top of whatever they're having a problem with. Because because one of the things I really hate is that as you go up in levels in traditional D and D style role playing games, the rules get more complex. Mm. Mm-hmm. When in my head they should get less complex because <laughs> you've got you've got more mystic power. You can mess with the rules of reality. Yeah, like you, if you can cast wish, why do I have a spell DC? Like that's I don't need that anymore. I just make stuff up. Well, you can't um, wish for more wishes. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we like when you hit your zenith, we just we take the locks off. You know, like the speed limit is gone. Do what you want. Yeah, you got one session. You know. Fire yourself into the sun. Knock yourself yeah. out. This is great. And um, then you're back down to you're back down to the dirt with everyone else, and it's great. Yeah. I love that. My my favorite. We'll, we'll move on. My favorite advance we've written, I think, for the oh, whole dear. game, is the Incarnadine. So uh, we, we we did the Incarnadine. They've got three. They've got th- three advances, which is um, ultimate credit, so you can buy anything. Ultimate debit, so you can visit the wrath of Incarn upon any one thing, or a happy ending, and you get to move out the heart and go and go and live with people. You you got a family, you can get a little job, and you get a happy ending. Congrats, it's all fine. <laughs> And like, like the, it's gone. It, it it expressly has no in-game effect. The the Incarnadines are probably the meanest, nastiest people you can play as player characters. Like mm-hmm. they're borderline antagonists. Mm-hmm. They're nasty people. And for some reason, we decided it would kind of be funny, but also interesting. One of the one of one of the top capstone abilities is you retire. Mm-hmm. You get to stop. You die. Years, maybe decades from now, mm-hmm. in a warm home surrounded by your family. That's that's really interesting. It sounds like the character itself is based around being selfish throughout yes. their whole life. Yeah. And in this sort of environment, retiring in peace and living happily is a selfish way out of it because it yeah. only affects you. So yeah, like even you, you cannot you, you cannot use it to help anyone. Yeah. It's yeah. perfectly self serving. That's really You're right, we were being very clever, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I, de- I definitely thought of that when I wrote it. We didn't just do it as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's really interesting because like you've got this option. You can either you can either have, you know, semi cosmic power for a session, or you can in quotation marks win. Mm-hmm. Which is and it's like it's the same level of yeah you get to stop playing it's a happy ending and it's like that's that's how hard it is to get a happy ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's it's one the class same, that can it, expressly get it. It's the same as I want to I, I want to I want to burn an entire haven to the ground. So I'm going to summon the Red King through my body, which destroys me. Oh cool! I want a wife and two kids. Oh, that's the same level of stress. That's the same level of challenge. <laughs> I think yeah. Look, I have kids. It sounds like the same level of challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's very fair. I, I like the idea that like the ultimate power you can get is to not have to play your game anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's fair. Like, the only way to win. We wanted to give people the option of like the the ultimate power is just you know what do you want to be happy or do you want to win? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like make that choice. 
Because it's genuinely can, difficult in a role playing game because anything. technically it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can buy the last train if the, if the Venistian Knight tries to send it to you. You now run the train network. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or oh, you go. Doctor, it's your dream to own this train station. Yeah, yeah. or, you can, or sure. you can just be happy for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah which Up will you. be 30 years. That's amazing. It's, it's just interesting to see what people will take there. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I like that a lot. I like the idea that you get to define your ending, that like that's the ultimate power is to yeah. say, like, this is what I want. It's not It's not just putting you in the spotlight. It's giving you full control of, of the theatre. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, set, set off these fireworks whenever you want. Go nuts. Show me a story. Show me the DM Listen, how you go. No one else knows, but this prop gun's loaded with real bullets. Go hog wild. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it then. We covered advancement. Oh, we did it. Amazing. Right? I think we did, yeah. It's like the whole point is that advancement is, is quick and snappy. Yeah. Yeah, and you, um, because and you've got to be doing a lot. The, the only hard bit is the choice. Yeah. Like, as you saw with character creation, you got to do that every time. And there's a lot of good choices. Like, oh, there'll be more in the, there's more in the final book. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that so much. Um, and as I said, the, one of the nice things is that you've already got a mental catalog of things you didn't quite take at character creation. Mm-hmm. So you're 30% of the way there anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, Greg and Chris, thank you both so much for joining us to talk about heart. This was really thank fantastic. Yeah, yeah, this was been a lot of fun. fun. It's great to, to just talk at length about... Because we are actual professional game designers, and it's quite nice to get the pair of us on and say, oh, actually, yeah, what we do isn't stupid. Yeah. It's quite pleasing. Because <laughs> we do that to each other all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to be... It's nice to be uh, nice to have a forum where we can take ourselves seriously. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So can both of you remind everyone where they can find you and this game uh, and what sort of things you are working on in addition? You can find me on Twitter at GS Howitt, that's G-S-H-O-W-I-T-T, where I'll be shouting about everything all the time. That's probably the best place to look for me. You can also go to bit.ly forward slash RRD Games, which will get to our website, which has every game we've ever written that we thought was good enough to release. We are uh, launching a Kickstarter tomorrow, I believe. Or a week ago, or whenever this comes out. Whenever you're listening to this, there is... Will be or was a Kickstarter. Google Heart Kickstarter and yeah. feed me. Heart, Heart RPG Kickstarter. Uh, go to go to either mine or Chris's um, thing. Uh, oh, yeah. And we will for readings. sure tweet yeah. about it, too. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you. And uh, take, a look at the, take a look at the campaign. We've got beautiful art. We've got beautiful things. Uh, we think you'll like it. Chris, where can we find you? Uh, I'm at the Madigan on Twitter. Um, but the easiest way to get a hold of me, honestly, is to go to the Roan Rook and Decker Discord Mm. Um, which you can get either by hounding Grant on Twitter, buying <laughs> any one of our products, or just going to our website at the bit.ly link Grant talked about, yeah. um, and join us on there, because we have huge, rangy conversations where our community yeah. goes incredibly insane uh, with community documents and just writes stuff yeah. to, like, constantly. Oh, my days, yeah. It's um, wonderful. It's, There's it's so wonderful. much stuff in there. It's, I mean, it's incredible the things people come up with. Ooh. Yeah, like we have, we have an active Google Doc that anybody can edit, for all the settings and it's yeah, we've got, we've got one for heart and one for spire and people just go in and throw stuff up and it's great to see to see people and, like, and like, like i've had to stop myself from reading it because i'm like oh, what if this is a really good idea and i accidentally write it yeah like we what don't want I to steal it? it and put it in a book like and yeah. accidentally miscredit somebody because we thought we'd come up with it and it was just something latent in the brain mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. um so we have to be really yeah. careful with yes that. please come to the discord say hello yeah well, thank you so much for sitting down with us. This was so much fun. Thank you, everyone, to listen. Uh, I can do this. And thank you to everyone for listening. <laughs> do, do you want to take that one again? Nope. I will. Okay. Uh, out. We'll fix it in post. We'll make it sound <laughs> yeah. good. Right. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter, at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. 
Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like System Mastery. System Mastery is a delightful stroll through the history of role-playing games. Except the games are terrible, and the hosts are real jerks about everything. Join hosts Jeff and John as they explore the weirdest games ever made to talk about what worked, what went wrong, and which Silverhawk was the best. It was Hot Wing, don't even add us. Find their shows at SystemMasteryPodcast.com or OneShotPodcast.com. Finally. That works so well in your accent. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to scour Costco like the entire store to find the only tea bags they had in the entire store. What? It's actually pretty good. <laughs> what, what make is it? It's uh, it's like a, it's a Japanese brand uh, from, um, uh, I think it's like authentic Japanese green tea uh-huh. and matcha. Okay. Sen- Sencha and matcha blend. Um, it's quite delicious. We, uh, I don't think we really have that sort of tea culture over here. Like, you, you have to be really f- oh, language. into tea to have anything <laughs> other than just generic. T- like, if you know what kind of dr- what kind of tea you're drinking, it's definitely seen as a sign of snobbery. Well, there's, mm-hmm. there's three classi- classifications of tea, right? There's English breakfast, mm-hmm. Yorkshire, mm-hmm. and Yorkshire breakfast. That's it. Those those are, I don't know what the f- Oh, language. Like, Yorkshire, Yorkshire is English breakfast tea. That's what I mean, yeah. But, like, it's the fancy version. Oh. I suppose so. Well, I mean, there's there, there's a little gray. I, I feel like it's stretched, but all identical. Yeah, it's the same tea. It's just how they're branded. Yeah. Like so, like what color box it comes in? Like what? <laughs> it's like you know, you know, when you go to a supermarket and they've got like the the bog standard, super cheap version of something. Yeah. And then the mm-hmm. expensive, like own brand, oh, very nice version, and they're mm-hmm. the same tea. It's that. Oh, okay. That makes sense. It's a class thing. But you gotta buy the more expensive kind, right? Well, that's where you're from. uh, Is it all black tea over there then? Yeah, Yeah. pretty much. That makes sense. Does it? Well, I mean, (laughs) this is this is very ingrained into our class structure. This is very important. I'm pretty sure you can grow black tea in the countries we stole. Yeah. Hmm. So that's that's quite useful. That's what I'm thinking. It's what we got it from. Into it. Green is more uh, in the in the Asian uh, center of the the world, right? Yeah, yeah. East yeah, East Asia, yeah. which we, we we didn't get around to stealing East Asia. Oh, we stole a couple of cities, but that's it. Like nothing, oh, yeah. nothing was grown with them. And it's, it's also that that's, that's that's probably why we're not so much into coffee as a nation because yeah. we didn't steal South Africa, South America, even. Yeah. See, we got that. We got to that. Well, um, I mean, we just like. I mean, we installed dictators and stuff. We didn't really mm. like. <laughs> colonize so much as like it's modern colonization. Fund things on the back end. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh... <laughs> crowd fund the revolution. Mm-hmm. You really look like you should be out on a back porch there, Grant. Oh, it's so warm today, boys. Look <laughs> at you, a julep. We've got we've got enforced breaks, right? So I can go and like stand oh, in a and- marginally cooler room. Yeah. Also, like, if you want to just, like, get up and walk away, that's fine. Yep. <laughs> Dejection from this podcast. I'm out. No, I'm serious. Like, people do. You can. I'm I do. To, yeah. Uh, you perfectly should. Perfect. If you need to, you need to. And yeah, that's okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Looks like a tiny right. bottle of beer. <laughs> I was like, it's so early for that. But then I was like, no, not for you. Tiny European lager. No, it's water. Coward. (laughs) 
I, you're working. We're both working. <laughs> this is work. That's fair. Okay. I almost choked on my coffee. That's I apologize. Fine. <laughs> okay. And I apologize. Um, I am getting over a uh, sickness. So if I sound weird at all at some points. Okay. Oh, I'm not going to call it out. Or? I, I don't <laughs> I just, you sound very strange. I just strange. don't want to, like, accidentally <laughs> sneeze and, and, and like, uh, startle everybody. Has Ryan been possessed? <laughs> no, if you sneeze, Ryan, it will scare me. Okay. I, it's... I'll try to, like, lunge at my mute button if that happens. <laughs> okay. I do always, like, scream a little bit when people sneeze loudly. It scares uh-huh. me. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I usually have a couple seconds of warning, so. Okay. I'm just easily startled. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. This is the slow part that we edit out later. <laughs> it's always the difficult part. Can we swear in the spit? Yeah, for sure. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Going in hard, Howard. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. Sorry, everyone. On oh, my good Christian podcast. <laughs> uh, for a while, people definitely thought that we were because our Twitter handle is just Creation Cast. Oh, wow. Can't of course. Fit character yeah. Creation Cast. Um, and so. Yeah, people were like, we had a bunch of like religious podcasts following us. It did not take them long to figure out that that's not. Mm. <laughs> Still, it must have helped the numbers at the beginning, right? Yeah, maybe. I actually wrote on the top of my notes like reminders not to swear. <laughs> oh yeah, you, you, um, we you, had people. You wrote it in a much ruder way than that. I did. Yes, seen your notes. It's, it's quite large, and from you, you used the biggest swear available to I remind did. yourself. <laughs> okay, now I, I need to know what does this note say because we'll just edit it out later. I don't know if it's backwards, it is. No, that, 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 that looks. Okay, well, I have to make this bigger because I can't read it. That's amazing. Kind of really, I'm getting beautiful. tired here. Yeah, no, beautiful. <laughs> don't do it. No. Was like, it I last got... time did Chris have one? He was like, I think he had a post-it note that was like, no f- oh, language. <laughs> yep, like, I just I have, to, I have to just look at it like, no, no, there are other words we could use, Chris. <laughs> To be fair, I still have a hard time with it, like a year and a half into this. I can imagine. So. It's Ryan's rule, not mine. I have the hardest time of everybody. It's fun. No. <laughs> I've heard Ryan swear like mm, twice. Yep. And it was both due to social injustices. It's true. <laughs> I think it was mostly just the cost of health insurance. Uh huh. Health insurance and healthcare in America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that, fine. that warrants it. That warrants it. Oh, language. That fires me. It does. <laughs> Fires me up. Okay. <laughs> really gets a, my little, goat. a little bit naughty, Ryan. I know, right? I, you, you know what? Actually, it's just a little pocket, and you have to stick it up later into the pot plug. Oh, you like gotta like, get it yeah. out. Just yeah. come on. You just gotta, you just gotta bird it, <laughs> Mama Bird. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just feeding the cat. <laughs> get a bit of liver in there. Cats would love yeah. you. Oh, that's the worst. It's horrible. Masticated <laughs> up a treat for him. Mm. God, this game is great. <laughs> mm. Thank you. God, I love saying French words. <laughs> Even badly. I... Hey. Oh, language. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a point to me, isn't it? <laughs> Damn. That's another one. I have you know my French accent is at, is at least passable. <laughs>